On today's podcast, we have a very special guest, our dear friend, Martin Page. I've known Martin for 32 years. I I met him at a songwriting conference in San Francisco in 1988, and we immediately bonded over music, over songs, over bands. Such a great conversation where we got to talk all about his career. Martin, as you may know, became a huge hit songwriter for other people with We Built This City for Starship, These Dreams for Heart, Me Morena for Josh Groban. He's had many, many, many hits, A King of Wishful Thinking, so many others. We sat down and we discussed his whole career, working with other people, what he needs from a co-writer, his background, his love of R&B music, his return to being a solo artist after, you know, not making records of his own for so many years, and a lot more. I think you'll really find it interesting. He's a great conversationalist, marvelous sense of humor. I think you're going to like this one. Insiders, are you ready? Welcome to Mubu TV's Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage artists and music business professionals who are dedicated to having a successful career in the new music industry. Here are your hosts, Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. Welcome back, Insiders, to another episode of the Mubu TV Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage your music career. On today's episode, we sat down and spoke with the great songwriter, Martin Page. We discussed his upbringing in the UK, his move to the US as part of the band q We discussed his influences, his love of R&B music, and his transition from band leader to hit songwriter for other artists, including songs like We Built This City, These Dreams, House of Stone and Light, his creative relationship with co-writer Bernie Taupin, and looking at questions like does emotional conflict and crisis contribute creatively to his process, and much, much more. You don't want to miss it. But first, a word from our sponsor. Hey, Insiders. Are you looking to take your music career to the next level? Then you need to know about the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label A&R, music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source serving the music business community for over 28 years with the most accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the A&R Registry, the Film and Television Music Monthly, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in print, PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit them now at musicregistry.com and receive a 10% discount by using coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. What do Earth, Wind & Fire, Josh Groban, Starship, Heart, Barbara Streisand, and Robbie Williams all have in common? They have all recorded songs by our guest this week, the great Martin Page. Martin has been a friend of mine for, God, it's going on 33 years now that I've known him. I met him at a songwriting event in 1988, and just, it's like one of those things, Eric, where you just meet somebody and you just click. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know that I would be friends with him, you know, for 30 years, but I just remember clicking with him. He had such an incredible personality and, and he still does. It's such an Great incredible sense energy, of humor. incredible sense of humor. And I think that's what, you know, that, that's what bonded us. But just his incredible passion for music is so intense and it still remains that, you know, and we connected on that by talking about so many of the different things that, you know, he grew up with in, uh, in England and, and just knew about and, you know, his, his work as a, as a, as a musician and a bass player and as an artist. And, and it's funny cause my, I had a, a tangential, you know, awareness of him, uh, not as a person, but he, as a band, when I was working at Arista, we distributed the label that his record Q Feel was on right. Dancing in Heaven so I knew his name but I'd never I never knew him right. at that time and so you know we talked about a lot of things uh, as you recall I mean we talked about you know the whole thing of what he needs from a co-writer about getting cuts about developing the relationships and, you know all of those things and then you know mostly uh, in the interview we talked about him returning 
to being an artist. An artist, yeah. You know? Yeah, which is one of the things that I was going to say that, you know, he kind of went full circle and got back into his roots, which was being with an artist, being as an artist and, you know, releasing these solo works uh, that have gotten, you know, very, you know, much critical acclaim. Um, you know, I, I also took from the interview, you know, about, you know, what inspires him creatively, especially about having the success that he's had at this point. What keeps you going, you know? Um uh, working with Bar- Bernie Taupin, one of the one of the legendary you know uh, lyricists, lyricists of, of all time, time. yeah, exactly. Uh, w- with his work with Elton John, and then of course Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Maurice Wright, which is such a huge influence on me. Earth, Wind, and Fire, and 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 to you know have him work with him, you know, just it was just a very very uh, interesting interview to hear his. Uh, point of view. And I always love talking to Martin. He is, as you recall and, and mentioned, he's got such an incredible energy yeah. and he's, you know, so bright and so sharp. And I think, you know, for you songwriters out there, you're going to really enjoy this. This is a really interesting conversation with somebody who's had not only a very long career, but a very, very successful one. And as well as very, very diverse. Absolutely. And with that insiders, sit back, relax, and enjoy our feature conversation with Martin Page. Martin, I want to thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. That's my pleasure, mate. I, I, um, I'm looking forward to it. You know, I, I'd like to start uh, with, a, with a personal question at the beginning, and that is, do, do you remember at what point in your life that you knew that music was going to be your professional career path? Well, uh, that's an interesting question because I've often thought about it because I, th- I believe that really I started quite late because... You know, um, when I think about most of the musicians and songwriters that I um, grew up loving, they'd all sort of started, you know, at a very early age to me, about 10 to 16. But I didn't really get um, serious about it until I was about 18 or 19. Up, I was initially going to be playing professional soccer as a young lad in England. And it was around that time when I was signed to Southampton Football Club that I started to hear some, um, you know, great music coming from America, Motown, and I was, uh, and I just, it hit me late, I I suppose. I was going to the clubs and hearing this music, and then realizing around 18 or 19, I probably didn't have a future in um, professional soccer. I absolutely devoted myself quite quite quickly to um, uh, getting involved in music, uh, playing bass guitar seriously, and taking it seriously, and joining bands in England, and so I suppose it was around 18, but when I look back now, you know, from about 14, actually a bit earlier than that, 10 years, 10 or 11 years old, when the Beatles were breaking, I started to become a huge record collector. So if I think about really my, you know, in a certain way, I was collecting records from about 11 years old and music was um, beginning to become important to me uh, around that time. Who were the artists and and songwriters yeah. that you most admired growing up and the second part to that is were they the most influential to you or was it a different group of people i i'm a pop boy really so pop music really went into my veins um at an early age um, although i didn't know it was going to be my career i was collecting records and so i was hearing everything from then ray davis the kinks you know lola Victoria, um, the Beatles were, were coming through at that time, and um, I did the Who, the Seeker. They were releasing singles. I remember thinking, and I think the best way I can sum it, that this up is, I loved vinyl records. So I liked the tactile feel of them, the color of them, that they came in different colored bags. That appealed to my artistic eye. I loved to go into a shop and feeling them and, and picking an out. And sometimes I'd buy a record just for the way the cover looked and, mm, the, yeah. and it felt. Uh, but I do know that I would look onto Pile of Fine Records and see a song I love by the Beatles. Let's say, for instance, I Feel Fine. And I'd look at the black Pile of Fine label I'd see the title of the song and I'd look at every all the technical stuff in the label. Then I'd see in brackets under the title two names, right. Lennon and McCartney. Yeah. And that, to me, just went into my veins. Like, whoever wrote this is in those, like, sort of worked out in the brackets there. And whoever created this magic, that's where the special, it specially comes from. I was very turned on by, I think, um, Ray Davis, um, the Kinks early, and uh, Lennon and McCartney mainly. I just knew as a boy... Uh, as it went on a little bit later, um, uh, Bernie Taupin and Elton John. When Elton John broke through, I was I was I, I instinctively knew that the lyrics of Bernie and the writing of Elton were very very symphonic, and the pop songs were of another standard. So yes. I was 
always fascinated by what was in the bracket. So I thought, whoever those names are, they're the um, wizards that really are making this final record in my hand um, mean something to me. Absolutely. Um, tell us about your professional career in music, you know, and when it began. Well, um, I suppose professionally it was, as I said, around 18 or 19. I was at art college and I uh, basically left art college and bought a guitar and um, bought a, a cheap car. So I decided around that time at art college, 18 to 19, early 20s, that I wanted to be a bass player in a band. And I want, so I went to start, that's when it really became professional because I um, looked for auditions and eventually got into a, a band in Bristol and I was being paid to be in that band when we got gigs. So that's when it professionally started. And um, very fortunate, again, didn't make much money in my parents who were in America at that time and I was doing these gigs in England, I'd had to say to them, I'm going to leave art college for a year and I'm going to try this. And although they would, I don't think they were thrilled about that, they thought he's incredibly focused on this. We've got to let him do it. And they would support me if money got really, really bad and, you know, the gigs weren't good. Um, that led from being in uh, various touring bands from Bristol. Then I joined a band in London. Um, that led me to... Um, meeting a guy in a band called Brian Fairwood, who became my songwriting partner for a long time. And we formed a band called Two Phil in London and, got, and joined to Jive Records. And, and that's when I started to write songs. So I suppose that would be, uh, imagine, you know, I'm around 23, 24, 25, still quite late. But I started to realize, even though I was a bass player and playing in bands, and my dream was I'm going to be one of the best session bass players in England, obviously I thought, I've noticed that it's the songs that make bands get signed. It's not even absolutely always the image, it's the material that really means something. Yeah. And that's around that time, 23 years old, I thought, I'm a pretty good bass player. Brian's a great guitarist I've met. Let's put a little studio in a flat in London and try and get a publishing deal. I don't didn't even know what a publishing deal was, or I went for that before a recording deal, but I had a sense that the power was in the song. And I could be a good bass player and be in bands, but being a songwriter meant a very long career. And it sort of spoke to me then, like, as a songwriter and being and as a bass player, as a mu I could play instruments quite well and sing. I thought, this is the beginning. From here, the tentacles spread out. If I'm, a, if I'm a good songwriter, then everything else will form around it. Musicianship, other bands, um, producers, it'll all come around. Was it always your desire to come to America or to live in the States at that time? Because that seemed to be the, the project that brought you here. Yes, I, I think um, this was, again, a, a matter of fate in a way, because my father um, worked for British Aerospace, and he he um, <clears throat> was one of the developers of the Harrier Jump Jet. He worked on the hydraulics. And America, the Marines here, bought that airplane. And so he was transferred to America for long periods of time. And um, I found myself from my school breaks and my college breaks um, coming across to America and spending, you know, six months in America, um, six months in England. It was it was. Um, and from that on, from fate, from having to follow my family here and into really down south that my father was at air bases where they were doing a lot of. Um, investigation on this plane. It was always sort of out in the boondocks while they did experiments with the Marines. And uh, I was s situated down south, Charleston, Savannah, as, you know, around the age again, you know, on and off from about uh, 18 on to about 25. And so um, I got this real feeling, um, and I didn't, go to, I didn't go to college here or school. I was just away on sort of long periods of holiday. And um, I, I would when I when my parents said do you want to come across I said yes but make sure my dad can have a bass bass guitar there from them and he worked with the Marines and he borrowed an amp and a bass guitar and I would just practice um, for those six months not really wanting to be in America I just thought well it's a break um, and that's when it really took hold of me this sense of American music I fell in love with a thing again instinctively I just loved the funk I loved the soul um, I felt like American music uh, was much more um, maturely developed than what I'd learned in England because it was very pop oriented and you had to have an image to get on top of the pops. And I'd come from a background with Jive Records where really they were making records like um, with images in front of it, like the Monkees or something like Tight Fit. In America, I just started the sense like, oh my God, you've got Parliament, you've got Sly and the Family Stone, you've got James Taylor, mature artists that yeah. their careers are able to go on and develop. 
So I fell in love with the American ethos of music. And then when I did go back to England to um, meet up with Brian and, as I said, start my songwriting career, I was very influenced by American music. It was in my blood. Um, I, I, I was enjoying the tubes. I was enjoying Earth, Wind & Fire. Um, I was enjoying uh, great music by Talking Heads. So when we, uh, when, we, when we made our record, Dancing in Heaven, which was thought of as an English tech record at New Wave, we did have a groove, which I felt was much more funkier than, let's just say, Ultra Vox or the Thompson Twins. I thought we had a, a, bit, of, a bit of deep funk going on there. And, um, and I think I was proved right, because Dancing in Heaven broke in America, but not back, not in Europe. And that, as you say, brought me across... As a musician, when Dancing in Heaven broke in L.A., I found myself here and a lot of um, uh, artists at that time, early 80s, and the record companies knew that music was changing its sound. And so uh, uh, they wanted us, Brian and myself, to collaborate with American artists at that time. So um, I think my (laughs) sort of semi-youth childhood in America... um, prepped me for doing a record in England that sounded uh, ex- English in its nature, but was had the American um, overtones. So I think the ingredients were just quite right. But yes, Rich, I, I feel uh, that my, my career was going to be in America, without a doubt. I just, I feel, you know, my career was going to be here. Um, I felt much more at home with the American approach to longevity in careers. Okay. Now, a- after the Q Feel album, you-, you didn't make another album for 13 years. Uh, instead, your path. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just found And out I like, don't know why. And I don't happened? know why. Um, where did he go? Yeah, where did he go for over a decade? Hello? And a half? Um, it, you, know, it, it, you know, instead, you know, your path led you to a very successful career as a songwriter and producer for other artists. And I'm curious, at that time, was this a conscious decision on your part not to pursue a career as a recording artist? Yes, it was. It was, Eric. Uh, I remember thinking the Dancing in Heaven album, the q record was good, um, but um, Jive Records uh, and Arista weren't really able to break it. Um, we were changing as a band. I felt much like we don't want to be a disco band and a synth band. I want to be more like Big Country. So our second single, Heroes Never Die, was more musical. Um, we, they didn't break that record. Um, and so I, I found myself, as I said to you before, the record companies that said, hey, would you work with Kim Carnes? Would you try something with Earth, Wind & Fire? Would you try something with the Commodores? I found myself in the rooms working with um, my idols. And um, q went on the back burner and I just thought this is such an education to me and in fact when you say you know 13 years it you know made me laugh because it sounds like I went to a monastery or something <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, but what happened is I worked even harder at songwriting and all through that period and, and in fact the songs that got cut around that time We Built the City These Dreams um, were written in the style of Q-Feel so I was uh, using the material I would have written for Q-Feel Feel. And when 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 Q, well Brian and I decided, hey, you know this our, our band isn't going to break, and we'd be we'd be knocking our heads against a wall. The songs we continued to work on were being recorded by American artists. But if you but I know those songs, Animal Instinct for the Commodores, Magnetic for Earth, Wind and Fire, Invisible Hands for Kim Carnes, they were really new wave um, Q feel oriented songs. I was very influenced around that time by um, Tom Dolby's um, Golden Age of Wireless. I just thought it was an exceptional, uh, yeah, exceptional was. record. Really yeah, I thought yeah. it was a Sergeant Pepper of New Wave. And, yeah. uh, so I, I found myself for a couple of years, in a way, writing in that kind of um, character style, ethos, feel, spirit, romance, uh, hence you know, the, the, the new romantics appearing. And so I was just—I was in the right place in Los Angeles, and you, of course, you had artists uh, uh, as wide as really Earth, Wind, and Fire to even Crosby, Stills, and Nash, believe it or not, all saying, "How do we change our sound?" Jackson Brown, should we use drum machines? And of course, we'd come from England, myself and my partner, and we were very aware of synthesizers, Fairlights. Um, and Clavia, how to program Lynn drum machines. So we were in at the perfect time in Los Angeles when I think the Joni Mitchells, the Eagles, they're all being a little bit like, oh my God, everything's changing. And here we were, songwriters that un- uh, loved the Doobie Brothers, loved Joni Mitchell, but also had this other 
um, skin about us. We knew that everything had to be a little bit sharp and uh, technology was changing music. But you're right, the, um, as, a, as an artist, I did drop the, I dropped the ball. I just said, I want to be a songwriter. Yeah. And again, as you say, um, as a solo artist, I didn't come till much, much later. Again, I'm a very late developer. But I, Brian and I made a conscious effort to say, if we keep following Q-Phil, we won't have a career. You know, So right. we need to um, metamorphosis into a, a, a production songwriting partnership with American artists. So I, I feel very strongly we made the right decision at that point. You know, What did you learn from working with them? It's hard to put in the words, Rich. I mean, now... You know, at the uh, the golden years of my career, I'm probably seeing it a little bit more clearly now um, than what I did then. Because you're in the haze, you're in, you're in the battle, you're um you, you you're uh, fired up. I, I did feel like a soccer player who was on form. I um I was recent, recently reading you know a, a piece about John Lennon, and he was saying you know when he was he and Paul writing together, they just knew how to take what was happening in the charts and see it clearly and knock it instantly into a hit. They just knew it. There was, he said, I had a period of like two years when I just knew. And, and for me, it was a little bit like that, like everything seemed to come together at the right time. It is uncanny to me. Um, I've been trying to put this down in memoirs because Earth, Wind & Fire, um, Elton John, uh, Peter Gabriel, you know, were all my heroes. And I, and so, and, and, uh, and I grew up, in a bedroom playing along to their songs on a bass guitar and suddenly you go down the rabbit hole and you're sat fa- facing them. I just left England after watching Earth, Wind & Fire play at Wembley Arena and within three weeks I was sat at Westlake Studio talking to Maurice White about working with him. Right. And then, um, yeah, it, it's, it's hard for me. I can piece it out as I write it down on paper how it happened. I do feel spiritually that once you are... Um, Lost in the naive, um, let's say, ambition and thrill of pursuing what you love and that you've worked very hard at it. I mean, I had. I I studied to be a bass player, uh, taught myself, but very hard, very disciplined. And I'd studied records. I mean, I was a a bit of a loner. So as a kid, being in America on my own, a lot away from my friends, I would put the headphones on and study intently. I was lost in listening to, say, Selling England by the Pound by Genesis, listening to Aqualung by Jethro Tull, listening to All in All by um, Earth, Wind & Fire, studying uh, Goodbye, Lebrick Road, year after year, and playing bass to it and listening to it and reading the lyrics. So I was a record fanatic. One thing that happened is when I did meet with Bernie Talkman and Elton John, uh, when I met Bernie, he knew, he, he said, he said, you're very much like Elton, you're, you're an addict, and you see it very clearly. When I did work with Earth, Wind & Fire, I knew all their albums. I, I knew how to do Maurice, I just because I was a fan, but also involved. So I always remember Maurice White saying to me, he said, if you keep this incredible enthusiasm and work ethic and keep away from drugs and alcohol, you have a huge future ahead of you. And I was very lucky to work with what I call, and I've mentioned this before, the trinity, the triangle of um, three great uh, creators who I believe educated me at the right time. And that was um, Bernie Taupin, lyrically, uh, Maurice White, spiritually in the studio, and um, Robbie Robertson, when I worked on his solo record for yes. diligence, diligence of looking for emotion and music. And between those three, I really couldn't go wrong. Um, and in between those points, because I was a pop writer, I understood pop records. I was working with bands like Go West and Paul Young, and I knew their records. So that when they yes. come to meet, when they came to meet with me, I say, "Oh, you know, Dancing on the Couch, you guys, Go West, I loved it. It was so musical. It was like Steely Dan, but you didn't have a hit, you know." And uh, and I knew that I, you know, I was such a record collector. I thought, "Well, what would Go West be like with Prince, the Minneapolis sound at the time?" So there was this huge. I think you can relate to this, Rich, because you were like this too. This huge background of a of a kid understanding understanding pop records. Yeah, um, yeah. Elton was the same. You know, Elton. You know, we live we live. If we're quite secluded at times in our childhood, we might pick on something that we maybe poetry, it maybe uh, books, but it also maybe music. For me, it was buying records, and um, yeah. and I think you know I, I, you, I'm seeing it clearly now, but. Um, I learned so much from being thrust again 
late uh, 80s, um, you're in the right place at the right time. But as my manager, Diana, said to me, she said, there was just no way that you weren't going to bump in these people because you were sort of aiming towards them without knowing it. So um, great education, great apprenticeship at a late stage in my life. And uh, every step has really been leaning on other people and learning from them. But as Eric said, uh, it, it, it was amazing to be. Sometimes I'd have to, although you're working hard, it, and as you say, oh, you're with Earth, Wind and Fire, but all you're really thinking about is I've got to win the day. Um, I'm with them. I have to win the day. So you're, yeah, you know, right. it's like a, a, a young sportsman being put on the field at 17 years old. Although he can't believe he's playing with his heroes, he's saying, this hour I have to win. And so a lot of what I'm feeling now, I'm real at seeing it, you know, like an astronaut looking down and going, oh, that's amazing. At the time, you know it's amazing, but you're in the game. So you're you're rolling on wheels that don't allow you to think too much. You just go, this is fucking magical. Excuse my French. Um, but this is, um, this is pretty amazing that um, I'm in a room with people that I've idolized as a kid. I've got to make the day work. You don't really sit there going like, this is amazing. You're sat there going, it is amazing, but I've got to be even better today. And focus. You've got to level it up. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to yeah. rise to that occasion. You've yeah. got to show Absolutely. why you're worth. Yeah. And, and, I do. I do. Yeah. Be, I, yeah. I do want to add here. I found, I feel very fortunate that Maurice White was a good man, a great man. Uh, yeah. And and he was about spiritualization in, in music. And he taught me, how to let music appear in studios. And I'd come from an English background where you have two hours in the studio, make a single and get out. With oh. Earth, Wind & Fire, Marie, Maurice, it was very much like layback, let the players play, feel. And of course, the American musicianship was unbelievable. And with um, Bernie Taupin, by just being around his lyrics all the time and receiving these lyrics from him, I would be there singing these lyrics, which were always different, always coming from a different angle. So that was seeping through my skin that lyrically there was another incredible world to reach for. And then with um, spending over a year with Robbie Robertson and Daniel Lemoyne on his first record, I was taught how to um, be patient, to um, uh, to allow the song to either appear or not, but not force it, and uh, to always be saying, is this song moving me? You know, um, when we wrote For an Angel, which really took a year to write. And uh, wow. yeah, I, I'm quite frustrated how long it was taken. But I, every time I worked with Robbie at the village, he was saying, we're a step nearer to something that's exceptional. That taught me another level of um, patience. You know, you've also spoken about that, you know, when, when I think the term you used was the Trinity on yeah. just, you know, beyond the, you know, living uh, up to, you know, getting to work with a Robbie or a, or a Bernie or, an, or a Maurice whose work was seminal and who you admired, the impact that they left on you as an artist I mean, separate from That's the right. whole point, but the yeah. impact that they left on you as an artist and, and as a man was obviously yeah. profound and, and has long lasting. It, it was profound. It was profound, Rich, because, um, you know, I, I miss that Maurice isn't here now, but, and, uh, but these, the, it, it was profound because um, if music, uh, you know, I've mentioned this to a few songwriters, young songwriters, when I've talked at places at UCLA, luckily, for, is that, if you love music, um, it's your, um, your ambition is not anything else but the love of music. Then you have a future. You know, it, it, it's, I didn't think, I thought about survival and security. It was always nice that you thought, oh, I can stay in a flat in LA uh, and I'm a green, my, my green card may come, you know, I'm gonna, and I, I got a visa to stay on. But my whole thing was I'm doing music. And I, and I try I try to impart that to people that for me, if you can recognize that um, your ambition is to be near music, it's something that gets you going. It's something that's in your blood, something that, um, as Leonardo da Vinci said, you know, lifts your soul. It's the invisible force that lifts a man's soul. If you really got that, and it sounds very grand, but it's not grand, it's actually quite simple then you actually bounce off of good people and your magnetic force, you know, when you meet with people, they, if they're like you, and I've sat with many musicians, drug addicts and lost in their careers. And you just can't, there's no linkage uh, because something mm. else is going on. But if that's out of the way and there's a purity of like, I can't wait to see what the next song was and Bernie and Robbie 
and Maurice were always like that. What's the next song? What's the mm. next thing we're going to sing? What's the next emotion? When are the, how can we lift people? What's going to be the next thing? We hope it's commercial. We hope it makes people move. But deep down, I felt from those three people and a lot of other people I was late, able to work with is that music was the force. And so money, fame, whatever you did, uh, came around that if your vision was really care it was really honed in on that you know it's as simple as saying you know follow your own bliss um in the sense that if that really moves you if that's something that you can't stop doing you'll you'll you realize you're fortunate that you're doing it and that the word ambition doesn't really come into it it's not like what shall we achieve it's like we're doing it we're actually doing it we're actually um making it happen there's a thrill there's a joy i'm sure for you two guys when you do the podcast it's, it's because you're giving something out and, and you're touching something that which is still hard to explain creativity art music the invisible force and i and i felt like i was very fortunate that most of the people most of the people i work with had that gleam in their eyes like what's the next piece of music we're going to be involved with and how are we going to express ourselves and uh, that might sound daft and stupid but you know it's not um no, some not people some people that have gone on beyond what they dreamt they do is because they've been possessed by um knowing that the joy is what they're doing whether it's you know, a little four-track demo that nobody likes. You're you spend as much time on it as you do on your big songs because you're sure. involved in in the in the magic. I hope that makes some sense. During this time, you met your manager, uh, the great Diane Poncher, who you're still with today. Mm. And I, I guess two part question: How did the two of you meet? And how integral was she at the start of your career here in the states with all of these meetings and collaborations? Um. Well, beyond uh, important, really, beyond. I mean, it, it, one of those time, things about fate again, um, I hope it, I don't ramble on too much about this, but I can remember it very clearly that back in London, Brian and I, if you've, if you've been listening to what I've been saying, we, en- uh, we ended up um, being signed to Jive Records. They wanted us to work with Reckless Eric, who was on Stiff Records and was a... Um, punk artists but we hadn't had any success so we said yeah we're up for it so we wrote six really good songs with reckless eric and um we were supposed to take them into battery studios which is the studios that jive were using and we were all set up doing our rehearsals um unfortunately reckless got very nervous and didn't want to go in and do the album so it was an aborted record but at, in those battery studios um there was a lady who was the studio manager and her name was joyce I can't remember her second name, um, but she was very chatty, and uh, we got to know her and talk to her there. And um, and I just got she's one of those ladies you could get close to. Her name was Joyce, and um, she she started to ramble on about um, all the years she'd done and the artists she'd seen, and so did I. And went off and said, "Well, we dream of going to America, Brian and I." She said, "Well, I've got a friend in America, and her name's Diane Poncher. And when you're in LA, um, knock on her door." And, um, you know, she's a lovely person and you'll just be able to probably kip there and uh, get a nice cup of tea and all that stuff. So that's how it started. This lady uh. just point said, and I, Brian and I, we had all our cassette demos that we brought across to play to all the record companies, the A&R department. So we were very prepared for our three week, three week um, soiree into Los Angeles to make our impression. We knocked on Diane's door. She opened the door and... Um, it started right from that moment in an incredible fate that she was working for the management, Cavallo Ruffalo Farnoli, um, which does sound like a mafia team. And it <laughs> scared me at first when I heard that. Oh, it was a pizza shop. I wasn't sure. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> she said, oh, you know, we handle earth, wind, and fire. Oh, I was like, yeah, really? Yeah, oh Ray Parker. God. Okay. Yeah. Wow. We- weather report. Oh, okay. The call. Um, and um, Little Feet, I was like, my God, you know, these are our heroes. And I went into the house, and uh, she allowed me to use her. She's very, very connected. And uh, and uh, a, a songwriter called John Lind, who written Booty Wonderland with Earth, Wind of Fire, she sort of right. said, you know, you should meet with him. And within two weeks of being in L.A., she, she was working with Ray Parker, and I make a long story short. She said Ray Parker would love to meet the new English sound, and I and I we played her her stuff. You know, we played her dancing in heaven, and she just went, "This is phenomenal." You know, she just instantly said, "That's a hit," and it wasn't a hit then when we came across. And she said, "I want you to meet Bob." And then I, I sat at the piano and played a few songs, and she just said, 
I want to get you to Bob Cavallo, I want you to get you to Ray Parker, and I want to get you to Mary White. There's something in you guys. And um, that's what she did. She was a fireball. Um, I noticed immediately that we bumped, we, and we didn't have a manager. We didn't have a manager. I, I, we'd been doing all this stuff ourselves because we were scared to sign to anybody. And I just felt this force, this American focused um, force. She's about three foot two, and I'm about nine foot eight. So it was a very <laughs> strange team. I had to look down at her, and she looked up at me, but we, she was a force to reckon with, as we've seen over the years. And yeah. uh, within two weeks, she took me to meet. Ray Parker. Ray Parker fell in love with me and Brian and he left us alone in the studio to play on Ghostbusters and we didn't know what we were doing but we just filled in the, all the music on Ghostbusters right. and we, we and suddenly we were, you know, by working with Ray within two weeks we, we were musicians on number one. And then I realised um, Diane saw my music clearer and with more focus than I'd ever known from anybody, any musician, anybody I played it to, anybody. Diane, because she'd had a musical background, her father had been a manager for Donovan when he was in America and Jeff Uttal, uh, I think, in 10 years after. So she had this real knowledge of um, commercial music and strong songs. And so every time I would play her a song, she'd make comments which would stun me musically. You know, she heard harmony, she heard things, she knew how to focus. And then she went in, she believed in me and Brian and Q Phil and particularly myself as a songwriter. She believed so much in me, she just spread me out to meet with people. Her philosophy was, because you can tell I got a big mouth, she said, if I get you in rooms with people, uh, I know what you're going to win. She said, I've just got to get you into all the rooms, all the, all the record companies, all the musicians, because of your, the way you are. She said, um, all i got to do is make sure I open the doors, and then it's up to you, kid, go in there and do it. And uh, I've been with her over 30 years, and uh, we couldn't be more focused or more close. You know, uh, Martin, during this time, you had a lot of success, uh, you know, or during this period with number one hit singles, you know, like We Built the City with Starship, These Dreams with Heart, both co-written with Bernie Toppin, you know, Elton John's longtime collaborator. How did that relationship begin? Uh, again, um, Eric, it was like, as I was saying, I, I, I was moving around all the publishing companies and record companies with my demos. And um, Dancing in Heaven was beginning the bubble on K-Rock. And so everybody that we went, I went into an office with, whether it were Brian or myself, was like, you're the guys at a Q-Phil. You would say, yeah, we're the ones that are on K-Rock, you know. And although it wasn't a big American top 10 record, it was almost like a classic underground record that was continually affecting Los Angeles, particularly with all the dance clubs and all the um, yeah. physical physical clubs at that time getting fit. It was like became sort of the, without being a top 10 record, and everybody in LA thinks it was. It was played so much. So I ended up in um, Chapel Publishing, um, talking to a gentleman called Bob Scoro, and he handled Bernie Taupin. And he said, you know what Bernie Taupin is? And I was like, absolutely, my God, yeah. And he goes, and I played him some demos. You know, um, I think I played him even, you know, some of the Q-Field new demos that we're working on. He said, I just think you and Bernie Taupin would be great together. Would you be up to it? And I said, oh, my God, yes, absolutely. You know, uh, with my mouth drawling and um, <laughs> shivering. I said, yeah. Um, and uh, he said, you know, Bernie's not involved with Alton at this moment. Uh, they're 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 kind of away from each other, not working together. And Bernie's looking for a project to get involved with. He said, well, "I want to I want to spark him up, and I think you could spark him up." He arranged for us to meet in a um, restaurant, and um, which again was you know I'd only been in LA for about a month. It was ridiculous to be sat in a restaurant talking to Bernie Taup and um, particularly on the back of Dancing in Heaven. You know, again, that's a song that brought me to uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and it brought me towards um, Bernie Taup and all. Uh, actually brought me towards Kim Tynes. That record was a huge uh, uh, ticket to working with people because it was happening when I was yeah. here and everybody wanted to change their sound. Anyway, I was talking to Bernie. We're getting on, you know, uh, laughing and normal stuff. And um, uh, they gave him my two full record to take away. And I thought, well, that's, a, that's the death knell. He's going to hear that and go, no way am I going to work with that English trash. I mean, that's garbage. Um, but he didn't. Um, and he said, I'm quite interested in, in this, you know. Um, and he said... Um, he, I think he called me and said, I'm going to send you two lyrics. Um, obviously, Bernie writes lyrics up front. I'd never done this before, um, but I took to it like a duck to water. It just was not, most writers go, well, isn't it strange to have lyrics and write to it? Not, Bernie writes so rhythmically and understanding a singer and what words you can sing. Anyway, I said, oh, that would be a thrill. And this, these two lyrics that were to test me were to see uh, if he could work with me. So 
it was just, you know, we were like each other, but with this work. And the first two lyrics he sent me were, We Built This City and um, These Dreams. <laughs> uh, these Dreams was, uh, yeah, These Dreams was called Boys in the Mist at first. And um, uh, it was particular. it was first given, to, he told me, to um, Stevie Nicks at Fleetwood Mac. And he said, she's, she's not up for it, or she has no it or whatever. And um, he said, I will, you know, give this a shot. And, um, so I, I went quickly, went out and bought a little eight track, little Fostex eight track, put it in the little flat I was renting. And my whole job was to try and do an exciting, unusual demo or two of those two songs for Bernie. That's all I cared about. So I sent him, I made, you know, spent a couple of weeks on these two songs on a demo, demos. I was very fortunate that, um, I, I was able to call him nervously and say, you know, I'm not sure I want to sing Boys in the Mist in the chorus. Do you mind if I take the bridge, the, which said these dreams and put it out front? And he was gracious and said, "That's no, it's fine. Alton does that all the time. So I changed the song to These Dreams. I remember taking the bridge and putting that there. Then I sent him a cassette and just sat back real nervous, not knowing if he's going to like it or what. Because we have to remember, if you've heard the demo of We Built the City and uh, and I, the demo of These Dreams is very much like August Nuvas in the Dark, I was still pushing the envelope with synthesizer yeah. sounds. Um, and uh, I didn't know how he'd take to that, you know, but he called me up and he said, I, I love this. It's great. Um, he said, I, I, I walk into the future with this. This is great. And um, off we went. And my job was to just, I wanted Bernie to be turned on to work with me more. And luckily about, you know, uh, within two months, uh, we built the city and these dreams were being passed around record companies through his publisher and my publisher. And at first, the motels jumped for We Built the City. <laughs> and I was just thrilled because I just thought oh, it shows that me and Bernie can have cuts and Bernie being quite quiet. And as you know, Elton has often said, you know, me and Bernie never don't be, He said, like, no, I never had any cuts outside working with Bernie, but Bernie had done that before. And um, then Peter Wolf, the producer of... Um, I'd met who was the Peter Wolf, the Austrian producer. Um, he took both those songs, took these dreams to heart, and then he took We Built the City to Starship. And uh, me and Bernie had our first two songs were two number ones within six months together. So pretty amazing little blast from the um, from the pad. You don't know when you write a song. Um, well, you know, you're happy if somebody else sees it and they cut it. But yes, they become kind of iconic tracks. Um, I, I, it, I, as a, as a just a fan and a, a, a lad who grew up buying records, if if I'm if I'm anywhere and suddenly it comes up, they go, well, you know, what did you write? And I say, we built the city. I've not known one person ever, ever, old, young, I've met um, that hasn't said, oh, I know that right, song, yeah. and that's a very strange strange feeling you know and my neighbors when they move in it they go oh we don't see it. i'm like why wow, is it so strange <laughs> you know it's 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 a very very it was a cultural yeah, I mean, phenomenon that song i mean yeah. it crossed i mean it was just and it remains yeah, it's, yeah. It's, um yes i mean we've we've the cities become ridiculously i mean it was a number one in england last right. year uh, at christmas by by being cut and uh it's had it's been hits for three generations and and i don't mean this in an ego way but it's on in movies and tvs i'm constantly diana has to call me and say you know this is do you feel good about this in this play and this movie we built the city went grew into something that i never comprehended mm. i mean but bernie bernie's very proud of the demo and we had a certain vibe on the demo which we weren't quite so sure of when the record we made but in general the joy it's given people and um, yet the youth, you know, I mean, in, in England, it's 12-year-olds that are singing the song. So you, you know you've written something that um, has gone into the earth and is long. I mean, people like Elton and the Beatles, they've, got, they've had this forever. They, every, everything goes into the ground and let it be from Hey Jude right. to, you know, um, it, and Candle in the Wind. These things go on. But, but I've even noticed from Bernie, you know, he says to me, that's one of the, one of the songs that, um, you know, it's, it's grown into its own mythology. Yeah. <laughs> it's become a thing. Yeah. And people, yeah. There are shops now after we built this city but i can i can guarantee you when you know when you look at a little lyric and you're singing it but I, I, you don't think those things but if you look at bernie's lyrics after hearing q feel what he gave me with we built the city you can see that lyrically i've made a point of this people always knock the lyrics but he's writing a very definitive modern lyric that is not use, usually you can't it's not really written for out right we built the city he's He's def definitely crafting a lyric which is more edgy, more to do with the new wave, more to do with the romantics, 
more to do with dance, more to do with um, meeting me, and what he thought was definitely a way to go. So credit goes to to um, Bernie for really writing a lyric, which um, I think, if you really look at it, was uh, him being aware, aware about how music was changing around that time. It's a very... 80s and uh, lyric and futuristic looking. So um, I think Bernie definitely crafted that for that reason after knowing what it would be to work with me because I was, I was a synthesizer kid. This wasn't somebody sat at the piano writing ballads. So I think Bernie had a lot to do with really, really focusing what that, that lyric is about. My I was just going to say, I mean, you just took the that. words right out of my they, mouth. They sing that like the <laughs> chorus, you know. Yeah, they like to knock it. But yeah, it's actually, I think yeah. Les has wrote a piece about this recently, about Starship, about We Built This City. And I think Mickey Thomas came back because, you know, it's obviously gotten that whole flack yeah. and... Uh, I think Mickey Thomas came back and wrote him a letter saying what that song did and, you know, how Bernie Toppin, uh, uh, you know, introduced it to him. And, uh, I mean, it, to That's me, it's right. just and an amazing, amazing track. Yeah, Rich um, actually sent me that. And, um, and in fact, only last week I put up the demo of We Built the City on my Facebook page, and I just wrote in depth about, you know, what the lyrics were really about and what yeah. Bernie was getting at. And... Um, it's amazing. I, I had about you know three hundred people just talking about Marconi plays the mamba, or is it Marconi, Marconi plays the mamba, or mumbo, or is it a steak? <laughs> yes, or they're dissecting. They're dance? dissecting everything. And I'm yeah. going like, wow, you know what the Beatles must have gone through when they were writing Polythene Pam. Then people must have been making up <laughs> these incredible stories. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> For you, creatively, Martin, what do you ideally need from a co-writer? Um, it's a great question. Um, to, uh, to be truthful, um, to have uh, to be truthful in in their strengths, um, to bring something to me which is that I don't have. Um, I think that's what I look for. Mainly, you know, honesty, and that they're in it for, as we said before, that they're really um, in it for the music, for the love of music. I've always, always gone that way. That if I've had to write with anybody, write from any of the people we've been talking about to even Diane Warren or any other writers that are just songwriters that are, I collaborated with. I was always wanting to feel like their heart was in it for the right reason. I know that sounds a bit corny, but that meant everything to me. If I was in a room with somebody who was just cosmetic and saying, we've got to write a hit, this has to be done, I want to copy this, I want to copy that, I didn't feel at home. And there are many writers like that that I bumped into in Los Angeles that were very successful, but I felt very uncomfortable with that. So I think myself, not being a trained musician, I came to songwriting with people in a very um, instinctive, organic way. And so the air has to feel right between two people. You have to trust them. You, you want them to be truthful and trustful on what they bring to it. So they, you know, they let you know pretty soon how they sing, what they, what they like, what they feel. You've got to be able to get on with somebody. You have to be able to sit in the room. It's the most scary thing in the world, um, I found. I, I My biggest fear for many years was sat in the room with somebody without any of us getting any ideas and just looking at each other and going, mm. what do you think of this? And you play something and they go, no, I don't like that. You play me something, I don't like that. So I used to do a lot of preparation before I'd write with somebody. I, yes. If anybody was put forward, put forward to me, I'd say, give me three weeks on my own so that I have a lot of ideas before, and I'll study them and, they can, and, and I'll think about what we should write. And then I would spend three weeks writing on my own, maybe get four strong ideas, put them on the cassette, build them a little bit up. And then when a person got with me, instead of me running to the piano and saying, here's my virtuoso playing and uh, I've done this <laughs> and I've done that. Right. And uh, I'm an all-rounder and I can sing really well. Uh, I would get, take them and say, let me first play you some ideas that I've been working on. See if anything strikes you. And if a person said to me, that second idea sounds really cool because uh, the drums or the rhythm you've got, that's going somewhere, um, we'd be off and running. I, I, it's always brilliant if you're working with a songwriter or an artist who sees what you're really strong at and then you see what they're really strong at. For instance, with Go West, they would allow me, Peter and Richard, to prepare mini demos for them. And, they, I, said, give, and I was honest. I said, you know, you've got to be honest. I, I want, give me two weeks of my own so I can uh, cook up something for, you, for us all to I can play you. And then if those things don't work and you're still, but they've been listening with you and they know you're a good guy and you're friendly, well, then you all jam together, but you're already broken the ice. Um, so they knew my strength was being left alone for a bit and coming up with concepts. 
and concepts. Maurice White was the same thing. Robbie Robertson was. He'd say, go back to your home studio and conjure up some of your magic and then bring it back and let's see out of any of those uh dinners you're preparing that it gets us going so that um but then with as i was saying with go west Pete, peter cox is a brilliant singer so you know you've got a singer who's going to hear what you're scatting and and uh, creating as a melody and he's going to grow on top of that he's going to ex- it really express something better richard was a very very good conceptualist so he he was the one who went out into the garden and said I've got a title called King of Wishful Thinking. Now, that was his strength. He would just listen to what we were doing and say, and write words and get an idea and, and look for ways to produce the track. And yet they, and they saw in me that you could leave me alone in the laboratory and I would get the bass line, get the drum line, get a chord going, get a hint of a melody and look for choruses. So I think um, the greatest collaborations are when uh, a team have put together where they've all got various different strengths they all recognize the other strengths and they're truthful and humble enough to show their weaknesses to the other people. So that makes a really good collaboration. If you're pretending, oh, I can do this, I can do that, and I don't want to let my guard down, then usually nothing of any consequence comes. So I think trust is really important and allowing uh, a person you're going to really, you know, I don't, it sounds over the top, but you're really getting intimate when you write a song together. Really, you've got, yeah. you've got you, you really intimate. You know, you have to let your guard down. Oh my God, you sang that out of tune. Oh my God, you played the wrong chord. Um, you have to get incredibly, for me, it was teamwork. Um, yeah. And uh, if everybody I'd work with, even Josh Groban, you know, I'd sit in the kitchen, have like, cup a cup of tea, relax, talk about life, feel what it was like to feel what the human being was like, and then, you know, get enthused about what you both love. Um, sometimes it doesn't work at all. I mean, I've had some disastrous moments with people, and it's a lot of that is because we're just on different planes of uh, uh, at the wrong time. Um, it is a very, very spiritual thing. And I, and I in my, um, shall we say, um, in confidence of not coming up with strong songs all the time, which nobody can, I'd say, please give me two weeks alone. I'm going to dedicate myself to you or the band, but give me three weeks alone. I know Mutt Lang was like that. A lot of producers are like that. You know, great, but give me time to really conjure up some things that yeah. um, might spark you. And I would, usually with a writer even, a, a co-writer, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go in blind. I didn't feel confident. I felt like I had to have a lot of things up my sleeve. Right. Um, and of course, it's a human thing. So you know, who knows if the person you're working with is depressed that day and his wife's just left him or they're coming out, they've had a bad drinking session or something. So you've got to be really uh, up for it to, to try and spark them up and uh, have ideas. I mean, there's, it's, like a, it's like a blind date. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You sit down with somebody and you thought, we're not communicating at all here and we're not on the same wavelength. So to me, right. preparation, preparation. Yeah, that's the key takeaway. Yeah. was a key takeaway for me as well. I, you know, whenever Diane would say, hey, you know, Stephen Bishop wants to work with you, I'd say, great, you know, but give me some time. If they said, you know, they want you to write a song for a film, I'd say, delay it for two weeks so I can really get into this mood. Because also, I was writing on so many different levels. It was Go West one day, Kim Kearns the next, Earth, Wind & Fire, Commodore, and it was like two in Chicago, it was just changing. So I'd, I'd be always saying to Diane, just give me, if you can, a week before I go into everything next so that I can take on the color, become a salamander and change my color to go and work with um, the Commodores. I need to be different for that than Steve Bishop, you know. So a lot of preparation, really. I, I mean, I, I, that's for me, it was, I think, good that I wasn't absolutely overconfident so I had to prepare a lot. Hey Insiders we hope that you've been enjoying our featured interview. Stay tuned because we've got so much more value coming your way but before we dive back in, a word from our sponsor. Hey Rich, you're the founder CEO, legend of Music Business Registry tell us what the Music Business Registry is all about. Well what it's about Eric is it's a company that is designed to provide the most accurate and up to date contact information for the music business. So if someone is looking to reach the A&R community, if someone is looking to reach music publishers, if someone needs to reach artist managers, if someone needs to reach music attorneys, if someone's looking to place their music into film and television and needs to reach all the music supervisors, that's the contact information that we provide. We've been doing it for 28 years. We're sort of the industry standard, if you will, uh, for the music business uh, and, and have been serving them since 1992. So 
That's what we do. Amazing. So if I wanted to find out, let's say, uh, A&R uh, people from uh, Warner Brothers, let's say, I can just go in there and find that in the A&R registry? Absolutely. You'll find all of the Warner Brothers in there. You'll find the Warner Brothers in L.A., Warner Brothers in New York, Warner Brothers in Nashville, Warner Brothers in London, Warner Brothers, you know, probably in Australia as well. So those are the the main territories that we cover. Amazing. And we're offering all of our insiders right now that are listening, if you visit musicregistry.com and use coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout, you'll get a 10% discount off your first order. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. Anything else you want to say, Rich? Well, when you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. Martin, you've written with a lot of songwriters over the years, as well as certain recording artists, you know, Go West, Robbie Robertson, Josh Groban, as we've mentioned. And is there a difference in your process when you're writing with a specific artist for their album versus just writing a song with another writer, not for any artist in particular? Um, yes, I think there is, you know, I'm just disseminating what you said there i think you know when you when when somebody says john waits coming to work with you you do right. take on the babies you think about the babies you think how he sings you think about um uh his tonal range you know oh my goodness he reminds me more of paul rogers and those kind of singers he's, he's a blue singer but not no screamer so you think about those things so when, when you write with that person or that band or that artist i think i you know you do take on their color um, although I would say about Go West, you know, I said I wanted them to mix you know, King Wishful Thinking with me thinking, oh, it's Go West working with Prince and having a slight um, Motown feel about it. Um, so you, you, my, my, my dream was to understand what they were if I worked with a band and try to then think what would it be like if Tom Dolby was in the room with Journey or something. I would just try and just <laughs> conjure up a, a, a spark that... I knew record companies or A&R people would go, well, that's standing out of the bunch. Because I knew if I was working with an artist that they would be working with other writers. So I wanted my song to be sparky. I wanted them to go, this could be one of the singles. This this, or this is so emotionally powerful. Like, for instance, um, Ghost. Um, I think it was Ghost in, in the House with, uh, with uh, the John Waite band, a Bad English. Um, Bad there was an emotion in yeah, there was an emotion in the in the record, so I thought this might not be a hit single, but they're going to lift, they're going to push this quite big in there because it shows a lot of emotion. Of course, if you write with this, with the artists, you don't always write the best songs, but you're with. And this is a you know a business thing that I used to feel very strongly that if you write with the artists, you've got a good chance of getting on the album because they want to get a few songs on there. So again, relationships with artists and them feeling comfortable with you was another way of getting, shall we say, substandard or reasonably good songs onto albums, but with a songwriter, say Diane Warren, or if I was writing with um, Brian or John Lind or other writers which were just primarily writers, we would just look for the best song. Um, that, is, that is a different philosophy. You tend to be writing songs that you think many people could sing and, had a, and were very appealing on a wide, wide range. So, yes, if I if you if I sat down again, just saying, if it was with John Bettis, which I wrote with, you'd be thinking... Oh, this song has to be overall, it could be from the Carpenters right through to um, Starship. It, it, has to, it could be Michael Jackson, it could be this. So there is a very big arc rainbow that happens when writers are thinking, let's have let, just make just a great song that appeals to a lot of people. Yeah, I knew if I had Tom Jones walk through the door, I had to be aware of Delilah, and I had to be aware of how he sang, and the kind of stuff he would he would do, you know, he, um you couldn't give Tom Jones magnetic or animal instinct. Well, you could, but you know, you'd be, it might not be the greatest thing. So it's again, very subtle um, things for songwriters to think about and producers to think about. It, it, it precisely, precisely. Martin, I want to, I want to shift back to Martin Page as an artist. And in 1994, after a 10 year run with an enormous string of big hit singles, you released your first solo album in the house of stone and light. And I, I'm curious, as I think our audience would be, what motivated you to return to being a recording artist at that particular time? Um, yeah, and it was a late stage to do it. Um, I think sub subconsciously, um, people I worked with, and including Diane, my manager, had subtly been saying, you know, there'll be a time when you should do your own record. And I was like, yes, maybe, but uh, I'm doing this, and I'm on involved with this. And 
um, by doing all these demos myself and singing these demos, um, and I never saw myself as a, as a singer. I did. I, I just wanted to make really good demos that got the emotion of the songs across. Um, I was being told, particularly by Robbie Robertson, and sometimes you know Bernie would come across. Are you singing that really well? You know, and and Robbie would say, "There's something in your voice, mate. There's an emotion in your voice." So you should, because Robbie would allow me to do demos of Fallen Angel, and he'd say, "There's something going on. I don't know why you haven't made your own record." And Diane had always been saying, because she heard all these demos, she heard she's been hearing songs that aren't even out, and she'd hear me right. developing things all the times, and she'd say, "God, your voice is getting stronger and stronger, and you're here, you, you, you know." This. And I would start to realize that um, something was happening, that I was finding myself more and more and more confident singing and more emotional singing. And I could I could have visualized vocals more than you do when you're maybe in the cue field days when you're just trying to get across a, a sound. I was finding myself walking into what the lyrics were. Again, I think it was because of singing Bernie's lyrics, I was becoming and being aware of the great work he'd done with Elton. I have to understand, when I did demos with Bernie Taupin, I felt competition with Elton. You know, I thought Elton's going to hear this or, you know, they're they're not together at this moment. But, I mean, God, how do you stand up against uh, these, this this uh, this uh, incredible catalogue of songs? So it made me work harder. And when I sang for Bernie, you know, even on his, uh, his Tribe album, a lot of the songs I would demo for him before he agreed to doing them. And it would be me singing them. Um, and uh, Brian and I, I think I, for, I forget to mention that every time we worked on people's albums like Kim Carnes, we were doing background vocals. And if I'd done scats on the record, like on uh, Invisible Hands doing these whales, Kim would say, you do them. So I was in the studios in America singing on these records. <laughs> Even Maurice White said, I want you two guys to sing harmonies with us. And I was like, oh my mm. God, this is too... English guys, a Scots and an Englishman wailing with Earth, Wind and Fire. This doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> this is, and Maurice would say, "You've got such a strong voice," you know. Um, and uh, he used to encourage me. Anyway, um, the main thing was doing uh, doing uh, Robbie Robertson's solo record. Okay. That after doing writing Fallen Angel, House Half Acre, and being involved in the next record, writing Sign of the Rainbow, Robbie said. Uh, and I'd seen Robbie Robertson working in the village where he's got a studio, like in an office upstairs, experimenting and building an album up by just being in this room. So I thought, I'm going to put a studio in my garage with all the all the vintage equipment, with the studio 24 track, and I'm going to do it. Now, also around that time, my parents um, had passed away and I'd gone through a big, um, I suppose, spiritual change. And I'd, um, I've been working so hard for all these years, I thought I need a break. Um, this is all getting too tense and too much anxiety. So I went to the Grand Canyon um, with Diane and just spent two weeks um, seeing a different, seeing nature. And I went down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and there was a Havasupai Indian tribe there. And I'd just been working with Robbie Robertson, obviously with his spiritual Indian heritage. And, it, and the Indians called the Grand Canyon in the House of Stone and Light. And I thought, what a great title. And I thought that relates to how I feel now. Worn out, tired, exhausted, anxiety, not finding a thrill from the music. And I thought, the House of Stone and Light is me. I've got to bring the light back into myself and I've got to build myself up. And I spoke to a few people about it. Um, and uh, they said, go for it. So I, and Bob Scoro, the man who put me with Bernie Taupin, had said to me years ago, I think he regretted it, but he said, whenever you want to make a solo record, come back to me. So about five years later, I knocked on his door and said, I'm ready. And he was like, oh, my God, I didn't really mean that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he was working for Mercury Records, and he heard some of my demos. He heard the demo to a song called Light in Your Heart I'd written with Bernie. And um, he heard the demo of House of Stone Light. He signed me to Mercury Records. And lo and behold, everybody I called that I'd worked with, Robbie Robertson said, I'll play a bit of guitar. I'd worked with the Blue Nile, the Scottish band, and they said, we'll play keyboards. And um, and also Phil Collins, who I bumped into down the line, he said, I'll play drums on these tracks. These are great songs. And I spent about eight months making this record in my garage. Um, but the great thing, Rob and Eric, is that I wasn't, didn't expect to get commercial success. And I thought, I'll only make one solo record. You know, I'm, in, I'm an old boy now. Um, it's not like I'm going to be put up there like Duran Duran. You know, this is a different kind of thing. Um, but the single, House of Stone and Light, which took a year to break, um, you know, went all the way to the top of the AC charts. Um, Mercury weren't, records weren't going through a good time at that point. Uh, obviously, I should, the album should have sold better. And I'd made another, and I had another record ready to go, a really good record after House of Stone and Light, but they just, they just, 
dropped everybody at that point and changed the label to Death Records and just kept the rappers. So fate wasn't good at that point, but the song House in the House of Sound and Light and the album um, did really well, um, particularly with deep fans, and it became a bit of a cult record a little bit, House of Sound and Light, a bit like when, um, Blue Nile, very deep fans that really got into it. Uh, even though it wasn't a commercial success, although the single was. And that, when I, when Mercury um, dropped me and there wasn't a label to go to, I felt relieved because the label wasn't in good good shape. And many, a few years after that, um, I formed my own label, Ironing Board Records, and, put, and decided to put my own solo records out um, for, the, for the pure thrill of it and for the pure thrill of trying to write better music. But House of Stone and Light came out of t- two things for me when I became an artist again. Um, I think really I wasn't an artist with q Feel. I think I was an artist with House of Stone. Like I thought my voice had come into a certain place. I believed in what I was writing. I knew how to write better songs. I'd learned a lot from Maurice White, how to bring different mus- great musicians into a record and let them express themselves. I'd learned from Robbie Robertson, take your time. And we kept the record company away from me so I could just try and make a piece of art to my mind. And, um, it was the right timing for me to make. Right, um, right. You know what I mean? A you, you sure. few things happened for me becoming an artist again. The emotional breakdown of losing my parents, being worn out by working as a songwriter, and Robbie Robertson and a few other, my manager and a few other people saying, I think it's the right time for you to express yourself. And of course, those songs on the House of Stone and Light, you know, and the record company being kept away from me, they wouldn't have been happy for me to record The Door, you know, about the concentration camp for Blinker. And House of Stone and Light is a very strange hit record. I mean, to have a have a number one song where you start off, you know, you're singing about Havasu by um, Shaman and uh, Mount right. Kailas, a mountain in Tibet. You go like, that's not really your usual fodder up there. Um, so I remember, actually, when I went to the Grammys back then, not for my stuff, but I was invited there, that um, I met Joni Mitchell behind, behind the stage, and she said, you're the bloke who did House of Stone and Light. And I said, yeah. She said, it's lovely to see great music back in the church. Wow, so that was, that, what a compliment, that, that, man. You'll remember yeah, that, that your whole life, in, yeah. Yeah, that stays in my mind, you know. Um, so um, that was, and I won't forget that, because that was lovely to hear from somebody I think has made the most important incredible music in her career. Martin, on Temple of the Muse, that had three songs on it that were recorded by other artists, notably uh, Mi Morena, which uh, Josh Groban and uh, Elaine Page both recorded. The yep. Long Walk Home, which Robbie Williams cut, and Everything You Do uh, with Mickey Thomas from Starship recorded. Did you actively mm. shop those songs to be recorded by other artists, or were they just organically discovered on their own? Um, th- they were discovered on their own, which is very unusual because um, when I, um, most of my cuts all through my life haven't been through publishers or people running my songs. It's been relationships. It's been me bumping, been me selling my songs or being with people and talking about them. The art, I always believed a songwriter, particularly in my era, you had to be able to sell your own songs. You had to go and knock on the doors. You had to have character. You had to be able to speak to people. You had to be um, able to be a seller of what you believed in. Now, with this, um, with this album, this was really going to be the follow-up to In the House of Stone and Light. Um, both me, Morena, and these songs were written as the follow-up to House of Stone and Light. Um, but when that didn't happen, I sat on it for a while and just went back to songwriting for people. Then um, people that worked with me on the road said, hey, it's, you should put your own record out. It's easy now, digital, uh, Facebook, uh, CD Baby, do it yourself. Have some fun. So I got the songs together. and. Um, made in the temple of the muse and for some you know very very fortunate it's happened to another another record of mine now in a temper piece a couple of cuts came from that as well i think it's the legacy of people knowing a little bit of my name and then they would play the record and um go this is a really strong song um again a little bit of a relationship with um robbie williams because i was playing soccer with him he's a football soccer fan so we were playing football and um he suddenly said to me out of the blue, we were just kicking a ball around. He said, you're a legend. And I went like, no, I'm just really old. He went, no, you're a legend. <laughs> I'm really old, Rob. I'm really old. And he, and he, he said, I bought your album. And I thought, goodness gracious me, you know, this is Robbie Williams, who's been England's biggest pop star for such a long time. He said, it's great. He said, I think it's the best pop record I've heard. He said, um, for a while. He said, it's just got so much feeling, but it still has 
great pop about it. I want to cut three songs from your album. And I was always looking at him going, yeah, sure, sure. But he really followed up on it. And um, we did three tracks from the album that he wanted to cut. And the best one that turned out was A Long Week Walk Home. So I have to say that's a little bit through relationship. Yeah, and in yeah. fact, a song, song I've written with him, is a, it looks like it's going to be cut by... Um, I think the gentleman's name is Ronan Keating, who was the lead yeah. singer with um, the Irish band uh, Boys Something, Boys Zone, and it seems that like Robbie's going to sing it with him as a duet. So that's quite, that's recent. I've only just heard that, so that's quite interesting. With 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 um, Mickey Thomas, Mickey Thomas has been such a f- fantastic uh, champion of mine. He's always believed in my music and has always stayed in touch with me. And every time I'd send him a demo, he's cut more songs of mine. You know. Uh, in films individually and with Starship than anybody else. He's just a great guy and believing in what I'm doing. In those years, I used to sing much higher than I do now, so I think that's why I feel to him. <laughs> a high voice. Now I'm down here, so I don't think he's going to cut too much more of my stuff. Um, <laughs> M- Martin? Uh, but, uh, yeah, sorry. No, no, I was just going to no, follow Marina, up on that. Go ahead. Yeah, me and Marina just uh, came about, I think, because um, um, Elaine Page... Um, like Josh Groban's version, and she wanted her own version. Version, and um, with with um, uh, me, Morena being cut by Josh, that was one of the occasions where um, a, a publisher uh, played that to him, I believe, and uh, he just called me and said, "I want to sing on top of the demo." And so we got I got him into the garage here, and he sang on top of that. So, wow. and then on the future, and a few other albums, Temper of the Temper of Peace. There's a song called "I Can't Get There Without You," and um, the Osmonds recorded that um, for their last tour of England. and made it the t- title of their tour. And I was thinking when I was a kid, you know, it dawned on me. Um, I've had my songs cut by the Monkeys and the Osmonds, and it's like a strange <laughs> thing. You wow! Know? Yeah. You know, I thought I used to watch them on TV. You know, all sure. Times, and I thought, you know, you don't bring it up. You go, these dreams, hearts. And Robbie Robertson and Peter Gabriel, and then you go, oh, and the monkeys, and the Osmonds. right, and, and the Osmonds. Yeah, exactly. I'm incredibly proud of that. You know, I go like, <laughs> oh, you know, the Osmonds, you know, bad, bad apple, and I, and I and I feel well, how strange. You know, it's a strange. I suppose you only get those things if you've lived for a long time. And your career has been, a and, long and it has time, the resonance with you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, so. I'm, yeah, very lucky that on my solo records. Uh, I'm not pushing them, really. I'm doing them from, from the heart. And yet, um, every now and then, a cut gets lifted off of them, which was one of my dreams, really, that I would make my records at home and have a little fan following, uh, enjoy what I do, concentrate on what I do, and then the odd person would see the strength of a song here or there and cut it. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting as you're speaking about this. I, I, I'm remembering House of Stone and Light, and I, and I remember in the Temple of the Muse. And in the Temple of the Muse has a much more organic production sense to it than House of Stone and Light. And I'm curious, from from as the producer, was that intentional on your part with that particular album? Um, yes, I think so, uh, Rich. You know, I had to think about that a bit, but I think yes, because... I was, again, we go into House of Stone and Light. I was signed to Mercury Records. It was important to have guests on the record. It was important for it to be mixed by a great mixer like Mike Shipley. We had to try and keep the great art there, but also try and get a, a hit or two there. Um, it had to, be, had to be focused a certain way. And then when I did Temple of the Muse, I, I, I sort of let go a little bit of that, um, you know, the, the front line attack. So, and... Um, I was much more um, aware of my myself emotionally. I take it very serious, um, the spiritual side of things, uh, than more and more as I get older. So I got into Buddhism um, uh, quite deeply. I thought much more about uh, people, the, the deaths of people that I'd been close to. I realized mortality was there, much more obvious to me. I felt a real passion to write some songs and I know you interviewed me on that record when it first came out. Did yes. a great interview. Um, I, I felt much more in um, trying to portray the spiritual side of things, uh, the, m- my connection to what I think I found about myself, you know, that little bit of peeling back the skin a little bit. It always sounds corny when an artist says, that, this is my most personal record and intimate. But it was beginning then, and it's continued on with mm. me. It's continued on that the most... When you're not having hits all the time and you become a veteran songwriter where you're bubbling and you're still doing the things that get, get through and you get in movies and everything, but you're not in that front line of the youth of, you know, 16 tracks in the last three months being on people's records, uh, as you see now. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a point when that's happening. 
The point for me now is much more like um, the Sting and the Peter Gabriel it time, Paul Simon time. You know, you, you're able to um, try and put out there something that you really feel proud about. You hope that there's something there. Everybody's like, my God, that's such a commercial song. That's in your blood. But from Temple of the Muse, it became more organic and possibly a little bit more, shall we say, quieter and more held in the chest. I like to think that record is a slightly blue record, not depressing, but in a more of a um, reflective place. My rhythms um, became, as they do with older people, they slow down. And uh, I was recently working with Ray Parker again. He's just played guitar on my new record. And we were saying, hardest thing for us as mature people is to bring our tempos up because we, we, uh, we're the middle way. We settle into these mid-tempos. It's yeah. a thing. That happens, and every artist, are, you know, from Gabriel to Sting, now they're trying to. You always try to push yourself. Not only is your voice changing and losing its higher octaves, your tempos are going into the midstream. Beautiful, because you write songs like Me Morena, you write songs like In Your Eyes, you write Mercy Street, you write the stuff you couldn't write as a young man. But at right. the same time, you're very, you're very aware, you know, that your that that um, naive edge is changing. Well, that's life. And I think Temple of the Muse, to make the answer is that, is it was moving into that more midstream place of where I was settling into without the pressures of a record company and being influenced more like uh, from the philosophical side of writing music. Now, this one is uh, near and dear to my heart, Martin. Do you, do you feel that being in a state of emotional conflict or crisis can be beneficial to the creative process or does it hinder it? I it's a superb question. I've seen that. Um, mentioned to many artists during their career. Personally, for me, I, I think um, the swaying of the pendulum to m melancholy is very useful, and swinging to the side of great optimism is really, really useful. Um, uh, I, I've written my best songs, I think, both ways. Um, mm -hmm. We built the city. Dancing in Heaven, Magnetic, were of great optimism and great enthusiasm and a youth in the body and a spark and a love for rhythm and a love for groove. And yet, I would say songs like uh, Mi Morena, to a certain degree, House of Stone and Life, um, a song like uh, uh, The Door on that album, were written from a very poignant place. And on Temple of the Muse, a song called I Guess I Will is very written from a poignant place. So... I don't think when somebody, oh, you've got to be depressed and you've got to be yeah. near suicide to write something classic. I think that's a lot of bollocks. I think right. that's wrong. I, I, I think but being aware as a writer that you are in that place where you're like sad or feeling anxiety or stress, but you're able to put it down and chordally and musically. We've seen it, you know, when Alton's writing Candle of the Wind or, or we're getting really the long and winding road from Paul McCartney, we know that there's something going on there. We know that the Beatles are breaking up and Paul was going through a big, 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 big change. We, we know some of these songs written that move us um, are written from a, a, a um, thoughtful, thoughtful place. And we're grateful for those songs. My Sweet Lord, George Harrison. We know they're dealing with something that they're really caring about. And yet that optimism, you know, uh, that great uh, Let's Groove Tonight by Earth, Wind & Fire, incredibly special as well. So mm -hmm. I don't think, uh, I think both are really beneficial. I don't think you should hide from either one. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. If you're up and you feel like funking and you feel like um, going for it and you feel up and you feel sparkly like I'm talking now, great, great, get it down. Um, that's a rare moment in life. I believe life to be cruel. I believe life to be short. And I believe there's a lot of suffering in the world. So, yeah, when you're, when you're like this and like, oh, man, let's get, let's get the musicians together. Fantastic. Fantastic. But then if you're sat and you're saying, oh, my God, you know, I can remember losing, uh, you know, my partner, um, say, for the AIDS crisis or something, or what somebody's going through to, put, to, to write Philadelphia, to write these songs. You can't write those without um, yeah. digging in to beneath your skin. You just can't. That, that takes a, you know, even George Michael, you could see where he's gone through with his life. Some of these songs that were happening towards the end of his career were actually quite extraordinary. Um, so I think you've got, if you're, if you're healthy uh, and you're, and you're, you're not being, you know, uh, consumed by, let's say, uh, drugs or anything, uh, alcohol or anything like that, but you're at least going through, which people take to not have the sorrow, to not have the pain. I think sometimes those songs, when you are 
got the strength to go, I feel really, really sad or crap. I don't, I don't like this. And you're able to get something out. Um, my favorite songs as a boy, even though I didn't know it, were songs that had a slight melancholy about them, mm. that had a wistfulness of a hymnal quality, Abraham, Martin, and John, um, I don't know, I, 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 Bridge Over Troubled Water. Yeah, I get the sense, even as a young boy, like there's something really special about that. Yeah. There's something really, really, really special and open. Blue Eyes by The Who, you know, even a rock band, when they can... And you find that many artists that have had this and I met it in my career. They have their hits, and then everybody sees them for that, and they have to get deeper. And I know Rich knows this, and A&R, oh, yeah, hey, yeah. look, for the deep, look for the deeper songs. You're getting Don't older. People are going to yes. want to feel your emotion, you know. Yeah. Yes. And I knew as a boy, uh, I knew as a boy, that when I heard Candle in the Wind, or I heard Goodbye, Olympic Road, his singles, I was like, oh, there's something that pulls up my yeah. heart here, yeah. because yeah. We, grow, we grow up loving our animals. We grow up fall in love with somebody, we love our parents, and they, they leave us. This great impermanence in the world is what humans have to put up with. And I think that what I've tried to put in some of my more emotional songs is that human sense of impermanence, that thing we don't really want to face, that this is all transitory and um, time is going away from us. Martin, you know, I want to talk about your solo albums. With a partic- There's a particular aspect about them that I want to ask you about because I've always found it fascinating. And you and I have spoken about it before, but I think it would be really informative if we talked about this, which is that all of your solo albums have such incredible, great titles. In the House uh. of Stone and Light, In the Temple of the Muse, A Temper of Peace, Hotel of the Two Worlds. I mean, God, it's, it's astonishing. The Slender Sadness, you know, The Amber of Memory. You know, is there a story behind them? I mean, or is, are there many stories behind them? How do you come to, I mean, do you give these a lot of thought? Because they are, there's not a dud among them. I mean, truly, it's a part of every single title of your albums is always like, wow, that is, I, I have a visceral reaction to your titles because they're so powerful. That, thank you, Rich. That, mean, that means a lot to me because that's how I am when I see titles. Um, I'm a voracious reader. Uh, a lot of my music, a lot of my titles, my songs come from reading and me jot, jotting down phrases that jump out at me and, and touch me. And I'm a romantic. So, um, you know, the poetry of the of Keats, of Byron, um, these great Victorian titles, these great titles that summed up. And again, we've talked about it here because I'm, I've mentioned to you some things in just passing, Selling England by the Pound, mm. Wollong, um, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, um, these these titles hang used to hang with me as a child and and still do. I, I'm conjured up. It conjures things to me. So I feel really, really. It's really important to me. Really important to me because it. Once I discover a title and I'm working on an album, I know it's the title, and I go, "That is the." Mm. And if I walk into a bookstore, which I still one of the rare people that does, um, or a library, you're looking on the sides of the covers of the books, and if you see a title like that in the house of stone, I'm going to pull it out and go, "What is that about?" Um, and great, so it's great literature that I think that is excited me. Um, mm. Great literature in the sense that, and also that romantic thing. I am a child of um, growing up on the southern coast of England where it's foggy, where it's misty, where you're near the sea, um, where you see the forest, where you see uh, folklore. Folklore is very important to me. It affects me a great deal. Um, I'm very, very uh, always on the lookout, always. I, yesterday I was at a UCLA conference for Leonardo da Vinci and I was just writing down t- things I was hearing from the people that were talking. So I'm, uh, it's fairy tales to me. It's yeah. fairy tales. Okay. I love to, yeah, a good movie title will always get me interested if it has a fairy tale feel about it. I mean, Bernie Taupin's one of the greatest guys of that you know first yeah. episode at Huntington you know uh, his first book he wrote was called Cradle of Halos I mean and it's yeah. that romantic sense of dust and dirt Pablo Neruda the poetry of Pablo Neruda mm. you know I just recently saw one of his poems and I said I've got to have this for one of my instrumental albums it's called The Solitude of Frightened Noises and I went oh mm. my god you know yeah. that is in a, in a phrase the solitude of frightened noises. Oh my yeah. God! That's, if, if you saw Eno's name underneath that, or Peter Gabriel, you'd be like, I gotta listen to that. You know, so sure. it's that 
it's that trigger to me. Now, not everybody's like that, and I know for me, it's it's that. I'm not a. That's what it is for me. Romance, um, folklore, um, paganism, a historical sense of places, um, space. Um, it's that sense of uh, which we would get really from that romantic, which they call the romantic age. And I don't mean just a romantic, but that sense of expressing yourself with that unknowable sense of, of space and of, of and, of, and of suffering um, with light. I mean, I think that's best way I could really put it is the human thing, you know, the suffering of what we are to be alive, but also we're going to get up and the moment we get out of bed, and we know what this is when we talk about it, Rich, you know, the people, depression and people yes. having to deal with life, you yes. know. So yes. when you see something like In the Temple of the Muse, you go, well, that In the Temple of the Muse was a bookshop. It was a bookshop I, I was, that I signed about that was in Victorian England. And that's where oh. Keats and Byron all went to. Okay. In the House of Stone Light is what they have a suit by Indians called the Bottom of the Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon, right, right. Yeah. So these things were just for some reason jumped out at me um, and, and I, I've got a book on my bed which has been there for maybe 10 years and I, as I go to sleep and I read uh, I've got this little brown book it's nearly full up but in, in 10 years I've filled it up with things I've seen read on TV um, phrases from books um, from from all over the gamut of everything and every now and then I'll just open up and, and I'll see something mentioned by Coleridge in his poetry or mentioned you know in a, a book about um, shall we say, melancholy, or a book about climbing across mountains in, in Tibet. And you see a phrase that somebody says, and you go, that is just um, beautiful. I mentioned to you some time ago, you know, there's the um, an album I'm working on called The Occupation of Hope, you know, and, and that yeah. was taken from a, a from a book I was reading by Linda Sonnet. So these phrases come out, and, you, and they jump out at me like red. You go, that is a, that's a, a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. For me, I mean, I can't see... <laughs> You know, and many bands doing that. But but again, I grew up with thinking, looking at Earth, Wind & Fire's album cover. So you knew they were dealing with, and Maurice was, with Egyptology and um, space travel and UFOs and a different way of looking at consciousness. And then you would look at, um, you know, for me, gen- early Genesis, nursery crime and trespass. And these, you, d- you were looking into English folklore and going back into time. Um Minstrel in the Gallery by, you know, these things stuck with me as a boy and I would buy those albums and just look at the pictures and the drawings and the covers and just think, that's a fairy tale. It's magical. It's a fairy mm-hmm. tale. We all like fairy tales, you know. Um, so I appreciate that, Rich, because I pride myself on that. And in fact, I was talking to um, somebody, um, Paul Moore from Blue Nile not too long ago, and he said, uh-huh. uh, your, ti- your titles always feel like they're... Um, a legacy of uh, volumes of books that you're going to keep following through. <laughs> yes. So, uh, no, it means a lot to me. I get a big sure. buzz from that. And, and as I'm working on a record, because I'm still a, uh, I'm a schoolboy, still a child, I look at that title stays in my head and I put it on, the, you know, my songs go into that file with that particular title and it becomes a book for me, a book. Actually, it's the best answer I could give. I see albums like books. So if a book is called The Temper of Peace, I would think that I was probably going back looking for a book um, from an alchemist, you know, from the 13th right. century. <laughs> right. That's right. how I would yeah. see it. That's me. That's me with my wizard's hat on. That's how I, I love it like that way. The, the, what was it? The Wizard of Minkolo, you know, and uh, I think it was called or... Well, um, by uh, Todd Rundgren. Some of these Her- Hermit of Minkalo, me. yeah. It was Hermit there of Minkalo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, if I'd, I'd use that in a second. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I don't exactly. think you see that in an R&B band. You know what I mean? Uh, no, so that, that's the thing. You have to find where you, where you, what suits you and your color and your and your heritage. But I appreciate that, Rich. That's, that's great to hear. Very welcome, but Martin. As you said, you know, as you just finished saying, you know, and and I knew this about you is that you are a voracious reader. But also, the thing that people may not know is that you're also a passionate film lover as well. And I wanted to ask you: yeah. Are there any books or films that have really resonated with you, creatively speaking? creatively speaking, that you could recommend to our audience where you have seen them and you've just said, wow, that just, you know, it stimulated something in me creatively or it made me think of this, you know, books or films that you could you could recommend. On books, um, there's a, a book uh, called uh, by Oscar Wilde. It's, it's the classic collection of his. It's called Beautiful and Impossible Things. 
Okay. And um, selected essays of Oscar Wilde are quite stunning to read because they, um, they, they're right across the broad. They're like blogs. I mean, Oscar Wilde was writing blogs about everything from um, the, uh, I'll say the decay of lying. You know, lying is what we face here all the time. Um, and uh, Shakespeare, he talks about prison reform. It's a really inspiring book by a man who had a very, very beautiful heart. Um, I'll give you two more books that um, will strike, um, I think, and how the person I mentioned with that title that I was telling you about, the um, Poetry of Collisions, a great author that people should read because of the way she writes and how poetic she is, is Rebecca Solnit. Um, Rebecca Solnit has written three to four beautiful books, um, and her way she writes is incredibly lyrical. And a book of hers called The Encyclopedia of Trouble and Spaciousness is a good place to start. Okay. okay. And a book that hit me because of its, ph- ph- and a great writer, ph- ph- I'll finish on this, uh, uh, of philosophy. He's alive now. His name is John Gray. He's an English philosopher. Um, he wrote a book called Straw Dogs, which is absolutely superb. Um, okay. And he has, all his writings are to do with the, um, in a way, the, ridiculousness of man and the things that he reaches for and things that are brilliant about him, but also the things where he is just uh, going around in circles. So John Gray's a, a beautiful writer, but more from a philo- philosophical place. Those are, the, I'll just give you that, oh, gone forever, but those okay. three, three are great. Um, I love, uh, on DVDs, there's a great collection on the Criterion, um, Criterion collection. Uh, David Lean directs Noel Coward. And it's some of Noel Coward's films, English films in the 40s. Right. Very, 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 um, um, uh, very, very English, but very, very um, emotionally charged with that sense of what it was like um, after the Second World, World War. Those, those, those are, that, that's very inspiring. There's about three films in the set there. Um, another great DVD and film to watch, I think, which really does conjure up. Uh, thoughts is called Samsara, which is really um, a documentary. Um, it's just visuals of things in our world and life just being studied. It's just like a a uh, meditation. It's so the film Samsara. Um, it's a Mark Ma- Magadison production. Magadison, a Mark Magadison production um, from the creators of the award-winning film. Baraka. So Samsara, it's, it's visually breathtaking um, and an uplifting experience, but also leaves you going like, um, wow, I've never really thought quite so deeply about that. Um, so, um, and I'll, give, I'll just look here and maybe just li- give you one more that I think is very worthwhile to make songwriters think. And uh, you know, Bill Moyers has a collection of DVDs out called A World of Ideas, and it's um, celebrated authors discuss their work, politics, morals, and the future of American society. And of course, Bill Myers does it, um, gets very much close to Indian mythology and, and Buddhism and the spiritual sides of life, but that Bill Moyers' uh, uh, collection of DVDs under the title of A World of Ideas, and it's literature writers and poets talking about what motivates them. No, those are wonderful. And and we'll put them up on yeah, our uh, on, on the show, the show notes. notes and have links and stuff to, to them share the oh, uh, okay, to great. share with the audience about that on, on those recommendations. Absolutely. Great. Martin, let, let me ask you, professionally speaking, what have your biggest mistakes taught you? Wow, well, that's a good question. Um, to never do them again, I suppose, you know. And yet we do go around and you say, my big, what are my biggest mistakes? I think... Um, Actually, I was writing this in my, my memoir, actually, is um, I learned my, my big, biggest mistakes, I think, were as I was learning in the studio. Um, musically, we're talking here, right? right. Yeah, musically, musically, creatively, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, coming from England and uh, being in the English way of recording, you know, in, in studios, uh, moving at high speed, discipline, money. When I came to Los Angeles and was found myself in the studios with bands like... Earth, Wind, and Fire, Toto, and whatever, and Dewey Brothers, you, you realize there's a totally different um, way of creating, a different um, aura, the way the Americans saw recording popular music. And so I learned quite quickly 
Um, my, my problems were that I would be maybe a little bit too anxious and over-dominating in studios and seeing it a certain way. I know I felt that a couple of times with Earth, Wind & Fire and Maurice White. Um, particularly on the solo record, where Maurice would put a lot of trust into me and say, you go, you produce it, you go and do it. And I found that I was working with the greatest musicians in the world, you know, Abel Boreal, John Robinson, and, and I was having to dictate my song to them. And I felt that I was learning incredibly fast and on making mistakes of, so I say, um, closing down the air in the room. You know, I saw it one way. Everybody had to do what I saw. And I realized under Maurice tutelage that um, there was another way to go and that was the spiritual way of recording music which I, I sensed and I knew that why I was there is that it, it was in me and Maurice noticed that in me but I also realized that I, I, um, I was a novice at it and that was allowing spirit, the spiritual side of musicians to create in their own way. From that moment on uh, my, all my records have been musicians playing what they want to play after feeling what I need in the song and then I would comp it and work with it like a, like a director in a film. I would let them do their parts, and then I would, many times, and then I would find what really worked best and relax them and relax them and relax them until something extraordinary happened without them even thinking about it. So my biggest mistake I felt as a musician was um, because of my character, my big mouth, and my enthusiasm, and my excitableness, that I could over-dominate. Uh, probably they would say that about Paul McCartney, you know, when he was with the Beatles. You tend to see it your way, and the biggest mouth wins, and the biggest noise wins, where we see that in politics. I learned that the greatest, the, the mistakes I was making was I had to teach myself to, uh, um, and I saw it with these, Maurice and Robbie Roberts and I think because they were older than me and they'd done it a lot longer I saw that they were willing to allow things to happen that mm. you hadn't envisaged happening. M Martin for songwriters who are coming up today what advice would you have for someone who wants to pursue a career as a professional songwriter what would you say? I still believe and, and I, the same way I would believe someone like Leonardo da Vinci or a great poet I still believe that those poets even if they were John Keats was working with a computer. Now, he'd still be saying, learn the strengths of what the word is. So as a musician, I'd say you've still got to study. Understand, as it is in my time, I think it, it's obviously it's changed, but I would still say, learn as much as you can about Glenn Miller. Learn as much as you can about Beethoven. Learn as much as you can about the Beatles. Learn as much as you can about Lady Gaga. Feel it, feel it, and feel it, and find what you like and what speaks to you. So my advice would be, first and foremost, you have to be good. You have to know in your blood that you're quite good, and you have to make a lot of mistakes. That doesn't change. You've got to write a lot of crap, um, but you've got to be so naively enthused about it that you would go on. You just would go on. Um, it doesn't stop. And so you write another song, and the more you get told it's not right, that then the better for you, because it will get right. And to bring... Still, my advice would be bring around you good people that uh, you can trust to, to listen to your songs, as I found with Diane as my manager and with Brian, honest people that uh, appreciate how good you are and get sparked up, but also say, I think the middle eight could be better, or I think this melody doesn't do enough. Um, there's a great skill in music now, which is um, uh, brilliant, the way these kids uh, work with Pro Tools and samples and that speed and create incredible rhythm. There's still a lack for me of incredible melody. Um, but there are loads of great, um, and they grab you, and they and they and they, like a commercial would on TV. Um, and I don't want to sound negative, but I do think that, uh, the great songwriters that are even going to uh, surpass what's happening is now is for them to have an awareness of, of um, not only bands like, you know, for instance, Oasis and Albo in England and Lady Gaga now and whatever was happening in the hip-hop charts. Be aware of it because that's what you're competing with. When I was a kid and I was wanting those hits, I was in the front line knowing what the top 10 was and the top 20 was. But I think what makes the difference between a great writer and good writers and the ones we're talking about and the David Bacharachs and Hal Davids and the um, Jimmy Webbs and, and the Bernie Torpins is this, under, uh, is this understanding of heritage and history in music. So if you are the hip, hip, hippest kid on the block doing the great photos, hip-hop DJ stuff and, and doing incredible speed and understanding that, um, that the new 
hits and the, what's happening and the sound and the and the and the, the, the mood we're in at this time, that's extremely useful because that was what it was for me when I came. But I knew that Jimmy Webb knew about music. I knew that Bernie Taupin knew, knew about literature. I knew that I knew about classical music and ambient music, although I was writing pop music. And so I think I will, the great writers will delve back to look at least 20, 30 years back. Understand why Paul McCartney is brilliant. Um, yes, it's the past. But when I was writing my hit songs, I was still looking at Glenn Miller yeah. and Swing and looking at, looking at um, bebop music and looking at the blues. You you have to have that great interest, you know. And then I think the biggest thing a songwriter can have is motivation. Motivation. It's somebody asked me recently, you know, what what was it? What was it with you? All these people you worked with? What? I'd say they were motivated. Bernie was motivated. Robbie Robertson was motivated. Robbie Williams is motivated. Josh Glover motivated. So motivation to. After I finish with you on the podcast, you know, I'm going to be working on some songs, probably not at the same energy or as many hours, but still <laughs> motivated to. Yeah, no doubt about it. Four hours is enough for me. But in the old days, you go to, 20, you know, 15 hours. But sure. motivation is, is huge. So in a nutshell, I'd say naive, thrill to be doing it and a love of loving music, loving what music does to you. So the, I still think that's important. Understand what pop music needs now. The, you know, what the culture is looking at, but also look over your shoulder to what has been brilliant and long-standing in the past. Even though when I broke through in the 80s, the Beatles were not having a very low period and nobody, they didn't really know how to move into anything new. But I was aware, even though I was writing, you know, We Built the City, um, I was aware of what Paul McCartney had done. Mm. And Eleanor Rigby was supreme. So I think the greatest any every any time I've read of some great artists, great directors, great authors, they're very aware of the past. Yeah, they're very aware of the past, yeah. and then they're very aware of what's happening now, and they bring them they bring a, an amalgam of that together. So history so, is very important to go back to oh, and look at all the greats, which is obvious. Yeah, yeah, huge. You know you. You have to look at that in everything that's great. You know that um, you know Da Vinci would have been look, looking upon previous um, artists. We have, we know that Beethoven was looking at Mozart. You know we know the Beatles were looking at Jimmy Reed. You know, um, and it goes on and on. You know we know that um, Chris Wynn and Fire will be looking back at Sly and the Family Stone. You, right. you 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 become modern on the shoulders of other people that have done it exactly. brilliantly. Just, brilliantly before you and now you have even more technical ability because um technology changes music i know rich knows this a great deal but you know pro tools has changed it studio uh, uh, 24 tracks changed it eight right. tracks changed it four tracks so now the kid who understands his pro tools he's the king he's the king and he knows how to get his he knows how to stream the songs through to the record company he knows how to do his bluetooth and get all his songs on ravening in his car but he must look over to his shoulder um to what brought him to that point and that yeah. there were incredible masters before that that you can pull from and it will make you stand out better you know yeah. um it will just it, yeah and make you become a better writer. it will and it will make you shine because they go hey my god that's a commercial song but do you hear a little bit of a i don't know rigby in there that is right. so sophisticated so sophisticated and it's so beautiful and we do like to get turned on i think ultimately um we do love to hear quality. We do love to hear sophistication and quality in when when we find our stars. We do like to know that when you know uh, Simon and Garfunkel broke through, we could hear that there was going to be great heritage there. We knew it, and some of these great artists, Johnny Mitchell, you knew that from that folk who was going to go into jazz. So the great writers, you almost they almost have to show like Trevor Horn does, a producer, like this is this isn't just it. There's more to me. Uh, and, you, and you can tell it in what I'm doing now. I believe that. I, I believe when I used to hear, um, a, a, for instance, Prefab Sprout, if I heard that record, I'd go, oh, my God, there's, there's a lot of heritage here. The first thing I would say with great artists was like, they are not just happening now. Stevie Wonder is coming because of uh, many things before him, and he knows about it. Um, so the, to me, the, the key, you know, to a, even a, fi a NASA pilot, I, 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 you know, an, an astronaut who my dad used to work with, astronauts were fighter pilots first. 
And before that, they were driving fast cars. So you must have a history to be brilliant at the end. Of, yeah. you know. Martin, what is the best way for people that are interested in reaching out to you uh, to get a hold of you? Yeah, um, well, actually, you know, my, my, I've got a, a, le- a lady in the East Coast, Vanessa Levitt. She's fantastic. She's been a supporter since the house down like that. She, does a, she runs my Facebook page, and I'm very lively on that. It's, she helps me, and I write back. I, it's very lively. You can really find more of what's happening uh, as I'm doing things on the Facebook page, I've got a little uh, a, a uh, normal website page which leads you to the core things of my my uh, career. Um, there's an Instagram uh, 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 an account which have basically they, they got me to set up recently where I have fun with, <clears throat> and of course the normal things Twitter. But my Facebook is the main thing, and my albums are on CD Baby because I still do the physical things. My fans are more into. Um, Physically, getting a, yeah. a CD. I'm on iTunes, all the normal stuff, but really you find everything that's happening to me and the tentacles that come off on, on my Facebook page. That's where I'm alive really every day. So that's And that's facebook.com Martin page, I assume. Yeah, I think, you know, you, you might want to ask my, and my manager, Diane is going to get to Rich and you, but yeah, Facebook is, if you went on, if you went onto Facebook and, and just dialed my name in straight away and went to the Facebook page, because it always comes up, you'd find everything you'd need to find about, because I'm still alive. Yes, you know that. You know I was. <laughs> because I'm breathing. I'm still breathing. Yeah, yeah, we'll have it all on the show notes. Martin, I, I, I really, I cannot thank you enough for this. This has been a wonderful, insightful, oh. and inspiring conversation. I, 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 I from from Eric and I both, yeah, we are both so extremely much. grateful to you, and, and uh, thank you so much for doing it. It's been a real pleasure, Rich. You've been a friend of mine for at least two hours now. And that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we, we go back, Rich, and uh, it's very, uh, you're a very, very, very close friend of mine because of the, from the early years, like you said, we met in San Francisco, the passion we both had. I think everybody left us in the restaurant talking right through the night and just gave right. up on us. So right. um, my, I really appreciate this. And, and Eric, thank you. There are great questions and it was yeah. a real, oh. real joy to uh, pull back the skin as such, you know, and uh, open the heart a little bit. Yeah, it was an honor. Thank you again. Thank you, man. Thank you very much, guys. You know, that was a really incredible conversation. I I love speaking to Martin. I really do. I I have known him for, my God, it's 33 years I have known Martin. I met him in 1988. We met up in Northern California at a songwriters conference. Now, of course, I knew of his work, you know, extensively in terms of the hits that he'd written in Q Field because I worked at the label that, that he was on, but right. I had never met him as, as a writer. And, you know, I got to say, it just, you know, every time I speak with him, you know, and we did a really deep dive. We did yeah. his whole entire history here. Right. Uh, so we really got a lot of great information. Yeah, no, I, I thought one of the things that I loved that I actually could relate to was early on in the story about him, you know, he, he was originally trying to be a football player, soccer, of course, you know, English, uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, soccer. And uh, and I could relate to that, too, because as when I started out as a musician, I had wanted to become a football player like an American. American football, even before the music bug had kind of, you know, I mean, the, the music bug had hit me, but I was kind of like in a crossroad. Do I want to do this or that? And I think if I'm not mistaken, something had happened to him. And that's what kind of caused him to think, well, I should probably go down this path. So that was something that I could relate to and thought was really great. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And, and I think, you know, I, I, I think he there may have been an injury or something. Right, right. But the thing, uh, uh, to your point, that I always thought was interesting about that is that he always was a record fanatic. Right, right. He was always one of those, exactly. like, you know, like he, he called it like an addict. You know, right. remember what he right. talked about? The same he, thing with me. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. I still love music, like, you know, but I had a real love for, for sports and, you know, thought that was going to be it. But, you know, then when I saw the injuries and the stuff that happens to these guys, I was like, that it's just not for me. And just, so it was just interesting that he, made that conscious decision to move on and you know i guess he kind of got started late in his life later in life later yeah exactly i mean i guess he was you know older uh older meaning you know i guess uh what 12 his, 13 i think <laughs> well it is in his college years right you know yeah yeah exactly you know the other thing that i loved was his his whole story of coming to america i right. mean the way he spoke about that is that you know when you are the kind of music fanatic that martin is you really have an understanding of, you know, America, especially in that era where America is like the ultimate 
place to conquer. Right. You know, the Beatles felt that way. Mm -hmm. A lot of British acts felt that way that like, you know, you can make it here in England and you can be a star, but if you can make it in America, like you've made it. You've made it. And Martin spoke about that whole thing of like, you know, wanting to come to America, wanting to conquer it, conquer it. And, you know, when he came here, he came to Los Angeles and he had an enormous hit record. Right. You know, the Q feel, the Q feel with dancing in heaven. Absolutely. And I thought what was so interesting is the evolution of that on how that led, you know, him being the the new cutting edge kind of artist. Right. With him and Brian and bringing all of those sounds to the recording capital of the world where they wanted all of that. You know, they right. wanted that influence with with Tom Dolby and, and all of that. And, you know, how he was able to bring that to a lot of the sessions and the writing that he did. You know, with Kim Carnes and with Go West and with, you know, all of these people. And and I, the other thing that I loved was how he was able to work with his idols. Right. That was really interesting, whether it was Bernie Taupin. Right. You know, and the first two songs they wrote. Which were, leads me to that next segue about, you yeah. know, we built this city and these dreams that I was going to, you know, talk about that, that, you know. Uh, how that whole collaboration started and how that whole period of success started because those were massive, massive. I mean, We Built the City was a massive hit. Number so. one hits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah both so. of them were number one hits. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so I thought that that was really great hearing that whole story, be- you know, just because of the fact that, you know, you think Bernie Top and you just think Elton John, you know, but he did write with several other people and, and contributed lyrics. And so I just thought it was a really, really fascinating uh you know, take on that. No, absolutely. And, you know, the thing is, is that he, the first, the first two songs that Martin wrote with Bernie, These Dreams and We Built the City, both were number, number one, one hits. Yeah. You know, that's the interesting thing. And, you know, Bernie had had, I believe it was, he had hits with, um, I think it was Only Women Bleed with Alice Cooper in That's the true, 70s. Yeah. That was the first time Bernie had um, worked outside of the Elton camp. Right. At that time. And he had success with 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 that as a hit record, Um, you know, and then Elton, of course, with The Lion King, when he worked with Tim Rice, you know, not working with and Elton had worked with, with, with Gary Osborne and other lyricists before. But, you know, he said something interesting about that period, Eric, which which I thought was really fascinating was the whole thing about how he wanted his songs when he was writing all those songs with artists and with other songwriters that that you know, were, were coming about when he was getting all those cuts, how he wanted his songs to really stand out, how the idea that, you know, he was very conscious that when he worked with an artist, they were probably working with other writers right. at the same time. And how, you know, he wanted his songs necessarily to really stand out from the other people that the artist was collaborating with. And he spoke about how he said, you know, sometimes when you work with an artist, you don't always write you know, the most commercial or the best song. But he says, he said, from a business standpoint, you often will get a chance pretty much to be guaranteed that when you do that, you will have the song on the album. Right. And that, you know, in that era, that mattered when you would get, you know, the the, the cuts on the record, you know, when albums really sold. Right. When they, when that mattered. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays that doesn't, you know, really move the needle at all. Um, and you know, and one of the other things that I loved what he talked about when he got into recording, uh, writing with other artists, you know, such as go West or, you know, Robbie Robinson or, or Josh Groban. And, you know, and I loved when we asked him about that question about, is there a difference in the process, uh, when, uh, he's writing with a specific artist for their album versus just writing a song with another writer. And, I thought that was really interesting, his take on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you get that, you know, you really get, I, I, I guess it's more of a deeper dive right. that you can really go into in terms of the process when you're writing for that person and getting them to uh, explore that more, you know. And usually when you do that, they're the one writing the lyric. Right. Uh, or, you know, contributing mainly uh, for the lyric. The other thing that really stood out to me, which I thought was really uh, an interesting, because it's only... I guess from the artistic evolution was when he talked about, you know, becoming an artist again. Uh, I think we point out and it was almost like, you know, a comical thing, but it wasn't really comical was when he did his first album in the house of stone and light right after, you know, he worked with Robbie Robertson, right. Who really encouraged that? Yeah. He was the one that told him, when are you, when is your voice going to come out and when are you going to go ahead and start, you know, coming back to what you, what you did naturally, what you, you know, kind of coming full circle. Exactly. And, and, you know, he got a lot of encouragement from, from his manager, Diane, as well. 
And, it, you know, and then there was this 13 year break, you know, and he talked about, you know, coming back. And I thought the, the interesting thing was when he spoke about the three things at that point, 13 years later, that brought him back to becoming an artist. One was losing his parents. One was Robbie Robertson. And one was, you know, being worn down by, you know, working as a songwriter all those years and the, right. the you know, the pressure and trying to get hits and, you know, always struggling and, and you know, making sure that you, you, you do that kind of thing. Again, um, to me, uh, what I thought stood out the most was the whole aspect of him getting to work with his uh, heroes, with Bernie Taupin, who he learned, you know, everything lyrically. With Earth, Wind, and Fire, who he yeah. learned about, you know, spiritually, and Robbie Robertson, who he said he learned about diligence, he learned about conviction, he learned about patience, and about taking your time as an artist. Hey, insiders, thanks so much for tuning into this episode. We really appreciate it. To get show notes, links, and everything that was mentioned during this interview, head on over to our official website at mubutv.com forward slash podcast forward slash show notes. If you're enjoying the content and what we're doing here on the show, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts from. And don't forget to rate and review our show over at iTunes. Five-star reviews are always welcome and help to ensure that our podcast stands out on the top rated and new and noteworthy charts on iTunes in our space. You can also find us on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all ending with the handle Mubu TV, which is spelled M-U-B-U TV. Don't forget to catch our flagship show, the Mubu TV Insider Video Series, airing every week on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Mubu TV. This show was produced and created by Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. This show would not be here if it weren't for our amazing team, which are the following. Interview editors, Sarah Nissenbaum and Alex Taylor. Show notes and transcriptions by Jani Chang, Nicole Caboglu, Lilia Owens, and Sarah Nissenbaum. Theme music by Disciples of Babylon. And be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the Mubu TV Insider Podcast.